As you might imagine, there are a ton of hot takes in the Marvel Snap community at the moment. Let's take a look at them and evaluate how hot and how true they are. Revert Professor X. Now, this is a take I think a lot of people are having in response to what one might call the Hella epidemic. I think it's sort of a not unreasonable thing to think, but I don't necessarily think that that is the answer for Hella, nor is it a healthy thing for the metagame. A take that often shows up once a new deck has risen to the top of the metagame is old deck wasn't so bad. And I think we really all forget just how easy it was to have a deterministic win clog game plan with Professor X while not actually sacrificing anything meaningful in order to get that. Clog right now is already a good answer to Hella. You can do a lot with the Clog package in terms of beating that deck. You will be able to win those games. And so giving every deck access to the Clog game plan will help you answer Hella, but it will also effectively let them just free roll that. And frankly, I think Clog itself is already a little bit problematic. Like it's not the least problematic thing in the game by far. And I think that it is a reasonable issue to have is to dislike Clog. And Professor X is basically saying all the benefits of Clog, locking up one lane and then cannonballing another, you get that for free. You can play it in whatever mid-range deck. Don't worry about it. I think that's bad. I would not revert Professor X. The game needs the old Sandman back. This is a spicy one. Since Sandman was just nerfed, and I think that right now, this is the wrong time to be suggesting to bring back Sandman. Not necessarily because it's not a fine card to have around. We're going to talk about that in a second. But because if Sandman were around, I think everyone would be hating on Hella way more than they already are. Imagine being able to go uh, Hell Cow into Sandman into discard two cards Hella. That sounds like an actual nightmare. I do think that there is like some real actual risk if they left Sandman the way that it was, that it would just be a Hella card and then Hella would have game even when it wasn't doing Hella stuff because it would just be points into Sandman deck. Not a fun thing to exist. Not a thing anyone should have around. I do not agree that Sandman should be a necessary component of the game. I do think that when judged against his cohort, I think Sandman tends to get grouped a lot with Doc Ock, with Profex with Leader, with Leech, with Eliath. Judged against those cards, he is by far the least offensive of them. But because he is so inoffensive, he ended up just being very consistently good in a way that those cards some of the time just were not. And I think that the while he is the least offensive of the cards that just say no, I do think that his power level maybe justifies the nerf more so than his annoying play pattern. But between the combination of the two, I think I prefer where current Sandman is at. Destroy needs to be nerfed or changed in some way. I probably could not disagree with this take more. And I think that the essence of why can be found, I think it was like six months ago, when Destroy was like really actually good and was a serious consideration for nerfs. You remember when they like leaked a Venom nerf that never happened? Like around that time, it's very clear they were considering nerfs to Destroy. And frankly, I'm very glad they didn't. And I'll tell you why. I consider decks like Destroy and Zoo to be the exact kind of decks you want to be the best decks in a metagame. They have very clear weaknesses and strengths very powerful ability to put a lot of points on the board and are relatively straightforward to play, but not so straightforward as to be uninteractive. When you look at how Destroy plays out, there's the baseline weakness to armor and Cosmo, sure. There's a second order weakness to Shang-Chi and Mobius and Enchantress and Rogue and that second order weakness and Shadow King, right? That second order weakness is what makes it make sense to me as a deck that I would want around more than it currently is. Destroy is a good deck and is always in the mix, but it is fundamentally fair. And I think that's the thing you want out of a top deck in a metagame. You want it to be fair. You want it to be a thing people can interact with. And I am drawing a comparison to Hella here where... There are many tools to interact if Destroy was the best deck, 
and there are so few when Hella is, and I do sort of judge the health of a metagame on how healthy you feel playing into the deck everyone is playing. Like, I will note, the metagame has gotten better as people have stopped playing Hella because it's gotten worse, right? Like, but I do think it's worth pointing out that, like, when 20% of people are playing a thing that is so deterministic and hard to interact with, it ends up being much more frustrating than when, you know, okay, you're not 100% dead to destroy because you have Enchantress or Shang-Chi, you have Rogue, you could even try to kill Monger, their Deadpool if they take priority, get rid of it on the final turn of the game. There's a bunch of stuff you can do to beat Destroy that isn't just a hard counter. The constant changes to the same cards over and over are not the signs of a healthy environment or devs that know what they're doing. It is, however, a great way to drive people away. I think that there's two ways to approach this. And the first is what many will call the shill route, which is to say it is probably preferable that they try to nerf something lightly before they nerf something heavily. And I say this based on previous times where they've come out swinging on cards and totally obliterated them. Now, it's not so much that they don't know what they're doing, so much as it's very hard for anyone to predict the future. So when you look at Arashem and what happened there, you look at Loki and what happened there, the one way to look at it would be the OTA system gives them the leeway to make up for any mistakes they made, and allows them to slowly ease cards down into the spot they're supposed to be in, and that is actually a good thing compared to other card games. Now, the bad way to look at this would be you never actually get to feel safe about the stuff you invested in, because if it's too strong, it'll get tuned down to about the level of everything else. And if you bought it with the explicit understanding that it would be something you would be able to play in a top tier deck, and it gets sort of brought down to like, okay, now it's tier two, you can still play the deck, but it's not getting the same results that you wanted. I think I understand why people would be frustrated with that. Now, on the whole, I tend to agree more with the first interpretation here because I was there when they changed Mobius and Mobius three weeks into it existing to a completely different card. I was there when they changed Werewolf by Night four weeks into it existing to a completely different card. That's just way, way, way worse. They've tried it. It is worse than what we have. And while there are no perfect solutions, I do think this one is preferable. The War Machine meta is already over because a three-card on-curve combo is as consistent as series drops. First of all, great dunk. Big fan of how you slid that one in there. Really well executed. I enjoyed that. Second of all, I do think that War Machine combo, kind of a drastically overblown thing to get mad at. And I will give myself some credit for not really ever getting that mad at it. Like, it always struck me as... This is a thing you can do, but it's not really all that good. And it is so face up that you should be able to handle it in most scenarios. I'm actually starting to wonder if there's like some unexplored territory there where we just maybe never got to the right deck for it or whatever. But I will say, I don't really see a ton of it anymore. And that isn't nothing. I think that is sort of representative of changing sentiment, right? One of the things that happens a lot when you're a content creator is people blame you for decks getting popular. They're like, oh, you told everyone to go play this and then it got worse. And it's it, it's not actually like that. The way it works is a content creator makes a deck and then that percolates outward. And that content creator almost always has a higher win rate with that deck than the wider populace will for a variety of reasons. And so you get these like day one videos that are like 80% win rate, broken combo. And they're not lying. That's the win rate they had with it. But then those that deck gets into the wider ecosystem. People start figuring out what it's actually doing. You realize that your cube rate is complete garbage. And so the deck starts evening out at like a 52% win rate or whatever. I do think the War Machine combo is good for what it's worth. I wouldn't be shocked if it had a higher win rate on the whole than Hella, actually. But I think it's like a relatively balanced iteration of the lockout combo where 
the real issue with it is how people feel about it rather than necessarily how good it is. But I actually will say, I think it's kind of underrated right now. It's definitely a space I want to play around in. Most people that complain about how bad Snap is right now are mostly just burned out by playing the game for one and a half to two years. Not everything is perfect, but Second Dinner does a solid job overall. There's two takes here. Uh, the second one, I agree with. Not everything is perfect, but actually, I'm not sure. Okay, the balance team, <laughs> Second Dinner does a fine job overall. I think they do a good job overall with the balance. And everyone who has issues with the balance, I feel like at least 50% of those issues are not issues with the balance, but are actually issues with the economy. And that is sort of the part of Second Dinner that I think you could argue is not doing the job the player base wants, but they're definitely doing the job that their balance sheets want. So I don't think it's fair to say they're bad at it either. They're very good at their job. I also think that... A lot of what's happening is that people want a Marvel Snap that isn't monetized the way Marvel Snap is. And people talk about like, oh, I could just go buy, you know, Black Myth Wukong, right? But that's not Marvel Snap. And that's the really frustrating thing that I think people are running into. They feel like they're trapped because at the end of the day, Marvel Snap is a great game. The gameplay is awesome. The IP is resonant. It is one of the most unique and best card games I've ever played, and I've played a lot of them. And I've been very good at a lot of them. And I think that this sort of feeling of like, I can't get this anywhere else, and I know if I'm getting it here, I'm kind of getting yacked, right? I'm getting, I'm getting ranched a little bit. I'm getting some unfortunate things happening to me. And I just feel like that is actually the root cause, right? Where what people are mad about is that they really love this game. And that anger comes from a place of loving this game and wanting it to be the experience that they want it to be and wanting it to be as affordable as they want it to be and wanting to love it wholeheartedly and the reason they're so mad, like the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. Love and hate are closer than you think. And they love this game, but they hate the bits about it that make it not this game. And I think that that is the main thing. When we talk about people being burned out or frustrated like that, a lot of it is that. And the other part of it is a sort of misguided nostalgia. Like they miss when they didn't know all this stuff when they could just play pool one zoo against bots and farm, when everything was easy. And I think there is some of that in this as well. People who constantly ask for new game modes and things like that, where it's like, what is it you actually get out of the game, if that's what you want? Not that that's a bad thing to want or anything, but like the base formula of Marvel Snap is so good and so compelling that I don't really want new game modes. The game is awesome, right? And I think people are looking for new game modes to recapture that feeling they had. And I don't know if you can. It's sort of like you're never going to be a kid again, you know? Those experiences are precious to you because they were one time, almost. Pool 1 and 2 cards should be buffed significantly. Otherwise, it will end up as Yu-Gi-Oh! New player experience is not even close to the real game. Second dinner care about new player experience? What about experience of players who enter Pool 3 and play their 4-6 The Thing against 4-7 Wiccan? I think this is actually a little overblown, and my source for this is I keep losing to people who have 500 collection level and just play Zoo. <laughs> like, this is, like, you know, for the most part, yeah. Like, there are some cards that are really unplayable in Series 1, 2, and 3, but also, like, the actual point output of Zoo is just good. Like, it's actually, like, very, very good, and you can actually lose to it if you get messed up by it. Like, that's some real stuff right there. And so, on the whole, I don't actually think, like, Pool 1, Pool 2 is different from Pool 3, obviously. And they can do more to make it a better experience. But the thing I worry about specifically isn't Pool 1 and Pool 2 cards, it's that bridge from pool two into pool three. And that's the place where I feel like second dinner needs to be the most generous because 
that is the place where I feel like they'll lose the most people. Where you're moving into pool three, you're facing all these high powered decks, and you have to make some really high importance decisions if you want to be able to compete. You have to invest your I'm gonna you have to invest your resources as wisely as possible. Get the things that actually allow you to compete because otherwise you will be screwed if you mess up your caches, even if you get unlucky, if there's bad caches there for a while, you're in a really bad spot. And I think they should be more generous with like build around cards in that space. Like I think it would be really nice if like maybe you hit like collection level a thousand and they gave you a Gilgamesh or whatever, just something. The collection track has become increasingly useless over time, especially for longer term players. The rewards are barely worth opening the caches. This might boil down to give me more free stuff, but it needs work to remain useful. Quick answer, borders are right there. I actually was struck by this one because I'm gonna be honest with you, I have no idea why they don't put borders in the collection track. I have no idea. That seems like it makes so much sense to me. Why would there not be borders in the collection track? Why would you not give out some borders as people go up and up and up and up and up? Because when you really get down to it, what getting a border will do is make people buy actual borders or consider trying to make their cards match or whatever. Why are there not borders in these? That actually does seem kind of ridiculous. Like, leaving aside the rest of what's happening here, I actually can't think of a good reason why borders are not in spotlight caches. They should be. That actually seems like a very free thing for them to do. Go slap some of those discounted borders, those like neon purples in, in there, and just give them out every so often. It doesn't even have to be often. Just like, you know, once every 100 collection levels, instead of boosters, you get a border. Dope. Kingpin's original ability was better than his current one. The threat of cards being moved and destroyed on turn six forced people to respect the Kingpin location and play predictably into it. The current ability is powercraft by easier cards like Silver Sable or White Widow. I think that Kingpin's original ability was honestly not very good. It's not like the worst idea of all time, but it is a very swingy and potentially unfun ability to have. Kingpin's ability was this kind of ability where it's like, if you remember Old Arrow, well, one of the things people talk about where they could just say, oh, bring Old Arrow back is you can just fill up the lane to counterplay her. And while that is true, and I mostly agree with it, it's the same sort of story with Kingpin. Oh, just fill up the lane and it'll be fine. But I don't think that sort of 50-50 is what you want to be a thing. I especially don't think that having a card like Kingpin that actually just says, you cannot move cards here, is a good thing in any metagame. I don't think Kingpin should be good because of how hard of a counter it is to that kind of stuff. Like when you look at that stuff, it's like, man, that is actually just impossible to deal with. And what they did with Kingpin that I like more about his current ability, they did two things. One, they added another lever on him. So if they ever want to buff this Kingpin, suddenly he can give minus three instead, right? Like they can do that. Two, they made it so that if his ability is impacting you negatively, you can do something about it, like play Luke Cage, right? And I think that's really cool. Because again, like when I look at Zoo, right? Like, okay, I get Killmonger, but I can play Kyra. I like that interplay. I like when decks are like, if I want to mitigate this weakness, I have to devote a deck slot to it. I think that's a good thing. Deck building in Marvel Snap is far less accessible than in other card games. People mainly net deck. There's little culture around building decks and few people who understand how to build a good deck. It's a shame. Okay, so this is a... I realize the person isn't saying this, but there are a couple implicit assumptions being made here that I think I want to correct, and I'm just using this as an example to talk about it. The first thing is... People act like deck building is somehow separate from play skill. And this was a mistake that I made a lot when I was younger. Before I was good at card games, I was like, oh, I'll be a deck builder. But you can't be a deck builder until you understand why the people you're playing are playing what they're playing. 
and what it is that makes those decks strong and what you might have to do in order to compete. The biggest thing you can do to be a deck builder is play a lot and think about why stuff works. And I think that people act like deck building is a discrete skill that is not informed by skill set and metagame understanding. They act like it's somehow totally different from that. And like it's all about creativity or whatever, because I think they want to believe that that is how it is. Because if that's true, then they're able to be creative without having to be good. But you gotta be good first. The easiest way to become a good deck builder is be good. And then you can understand why your opponents are doing what they're doing, why the metagame is the way it is, what it is, what this whole, like, I guess you call it like an economy of decks is based on why people are making the deck building decisions that they're making, what it is to do that. And additionally, I think people get mad at quote unquote net decking. That feels ridiculous to me. A, there's 12 cards in a deck, but B, there's 24 hours in a day. If Joey take plays on the shitter, wants to be able to play a good deck without having to deck build, he should be able to do that because he only plays the game while he's taking a poop. And that's fine. There are varying levels of investment to the game, and it's good that someone can Google best hella deck, click a button, import it, and then just go play that while they're pooping because that's what you do when you play hella. I think that those two conceptions ultimately are things that really bother me in terms of how people look at this game. Your ability to deck build is not independent of your skill at the game, it is informed by it. Because the better you are, the better you'll understand how to actually attack metagames. When people talk about great deck builders in other games, they're not talking about, you know, a guy in gold three. They're talking about maybe someone who's not at the absolute pinnacle of the ladder, but someone who is very competitive at the top end. That is what is happening, right? Like you cannot just be a guy who knows nothing and quote unquote deck build. That's not what this is. And uh, by sort of way of mentioning this, there are several players who I think are really great deck builders. Yo Woody, Big Baby, but there are a bunch of players who I greatly respect as deck builders, but they are able to do this because they were good already. They're good. They say, I would like to try this because I think it will be good into X, Y, Z. I think the timing is right. I think the context is right. And that's what makes you a good deck builder. It's hard to be one of those because you have to be good at the game. But I don't think you have to be like really good at the game. I don't think you have to be like, you know, constantly in top 100 or whatever. You know who's a good deck builder? Binks is a good deck builder. Dara is a good deck builder. Like, and these are not people who are making their rank a forefront of their content. Regis Kilbin is a good deck builder, right? But these are all still people who play a lot of Marvel Snap, have a lot of understanding of the game, and are at least playing a reasonable amount in Infinite, right? Like, you, they, they get it, right? And there is sort of a baseline to really understand things if you want to be a deck builder. You know, it's, it's important to be good, too. Eliath was okay destroying unrevealed cards. Prof X was okay as it was also. Most of the nerfs are just because people cry a lot. I see a variety of people saying things like this basically all the time. Like, if you don't hear stuff like this, you just aren't making Marvel Snap content. You just aren't doing it. This is like a comment I got on every YouTube video. Every time I talk about anything, someone is going to say this. And I think it's probably worth getting on record that it's wrong as shit. It's incredibly misguided and a very incorrect thing to believe. There are a loud contingent of whiners on Marvel Snap Twitter who complain about everything and are wrong about everything. I, I'm literally thinking of like multiple specific people who I have had to mute for doing this. But they are not the reason why stuff gets nerfed or buffed. Community sentiment as far as I'm aware, is not something that is a massive factor. It is more like a, eh, we're not sure about this, let's see what we can do. When it comes to Eliath destroying those cards, 
Eliath might be the worst possible example to use because this is a card that was released as a 6-5, lost 3 power, and went up in win rate and cube rate. That is indicative of a design mistake. That is a mistake. They messed up. Old Eliath had no actual levers for which to balance him. That is bad. New Eliath, we had him at a 6-8 and he wasn't very good. They made him 6-10 and he's being played a lot. There is a lever on the card that matters. Objectively, a better move for them to make. Not even close. Professor X, we covered a little bit earlier, but in case you skip to this part of the video, I personally believe that I have plenty of issues with Clog as a deck type as it is right now. What Professor X allowed you to do is effectively splash the Clog endgame into any mid-range deck. What you normally would have to invest multiple cards to pull off, i.e. clogging a lane, playing a cannonball somewhere else, you get for free with Prof X Cannonball. You get that with your scalers in the form of Fina. You end up creating a deck that is fundamentally problematic. I think that both of these changes are the exact wrong things to look at if you want to look at cards that didn't deserve to get nerfed that only got nerfed because of whiners. I think if you're looking at cards that only got nerfed because of whiners, Hella the first time is a card they like specifically name-checked about that. Leech probably is a card that got nerfed because of whiners, but those were not cards that were not good. These are cards that were very, very good and also people hated. Example would be Sandman, right? People like to act like it's just constant whining that gets things nerfed, but it's the other way around. When people are whining about something, overwhelmingly, it's because they're losing to it, which means not that it's the perfect barometer of how strong a card is, but people don't whine about unfun cards that they don't get the shit kicked out of them with. They whine about the ones they are getting obliterated by. That's what people are complaining about. You have your ordering mixed up here. It's the other way around. Arashem is the worst designed card in the game, and that includes pre-nerf iterations of existing cards. Marvel Snap is a heavily contextual game where after seeing two or three cards, you should know what deck they are running and can plan around trying to play around their game plan as you'd have a general idea on what to expect in the following turns. But RHM decks are not like this because half of their deck is random cards, so it's almost impossible to plan out against them because they could never have anything, or they could have anything, and you'll never know what it is until it's too late. Because of this, most of their wins are purely by luck, and this allows bad players to win more often and gain more cubes than they should. I am only going to take issue with a couple parts of this. The first thing is, they are, as far as I'm aware, accurately describing RSM decks when they talk about the play patterns. The part I think this person is wrong about is the part where they say it allows bad players to win more. I actually think that RSM is a deck that rewards good players more. And I say this because putting together these random cards in a way that is productive is something that is that you are going to be better at the better you are at the game. I have found, I, I, I'm playing a decent amount of Arashem right now. I don't think it's very good, but I just like it. The same way I just liked playing Loki, where it's like, I like that these games are different. I like that I get chances to flex muscles that I don't normally get to flex and get a chance to really like skill out on people and go somewhere that otherwise I would be unable to go. It is one of the decks in the game that I feel allows me a greater amount of skill expression, relatively speaking. It's just a different kind of skill. It's not the sort of uh, what you'd call more like a rote memorization of a bounce deck or a move deck, where it's just, I need to have, I need to have this like very domain specific knowledge that applies to these decks, the mechanics in them. Phoenix Force, an example of that, right? But it is a different kind of thing where it's like, I have all these game pieces. Some of them suck. I need to figure out how to win with them. I need to do what I can. I enjoy that puzzle. I think it's actually pretty fun. And so I think it's sort of the other way around where RSM is better, the better you are and worse, the worse you are at using what it gives you. Silk deserves to be a 2-7. I 
find it hard to agree with this take. Because I think you could reasonably say, all right, we should make Silk a 2-7 because 2-5 then is what 2-7 is now. But I don't think you can actually do that. Like, I think that would be too egregious power creep-wise for them to do. If they made a 2-7, I would be like, you guys are really, really power creeping the game, right? Remember how everyone reacted when, like, Copycat and Nocturne were three fives? If they just were like, yeah, there's a 2-7 now, that would throw the whole energy curve out of whack. You would just feel weird about it. I feel like US Agent is problematic at a much more conditional 2-7. This would just be a 2-7 most of the time. With some Craven upside. I just, I don't think you can ever seriously look at Silk and say with a straight face that you should be able to give her more power. I don't think you can. I don't think you can go above 2-5 right now. I don't know what would enable you to do that, but like, I don't know how you can straight face say we should have a 2-6 in the game. That just seems very not fair. And even if the card isn't very good, it just causes all sorts of problems up and down the curve. And I feel this way for the record about Hydra Bob, who I don't think should be a 1-5, right? Like, I feel like these cards are problematic because of the way they sort of cascade up. And the reason they're not seen as problematic is because they're problematic by degrees, right? It's just like, this is just a 1-5. It's just going to be bigger than whatever else you can play for the cost. This is just a 2-7. It's just going to be bigger than whatever else you play for the cost. But people don't care about cards like that. They don't care about cards that are imbalanced and just like consistently strong. They care about cards that are like, Holy crap, I just got blown out by that. And you can see that. And like, like that is the real bias that I think Marvel Snap people have, where it's like they're biased towards hating cards that are the reason they lost and not the building blocks of the strategy, right? Uh, it's very easy to look at like uh, a Wiccan deck playing the Hydra Bob and be like, I lost because of Wiccan, when maybe you would have been able to win if a Hydra Bob wasn't a 1-5, right? It's very easy to look at the engines and the finishers and not just the straight up, this is just really good cards because they don't feel as bad, but I do think they would be as bad to make. Complaining about emotes is cringe. Most people have no idea about your feelings on emotes and the common consensus is that emotes are a positive way to show sportsmanship. Attacking them publicly for it and name shaming is quite frankly embarrassing. I read this as a dunk on me, but... As far as I know, I have never name shamed someone for emoting unless you mean they emote me and I tell them to shut up on my stream. I don't like go on Twitter and say, so and so emoted me, I hate them for doing this. And I don't really know anyone who does. And I think that by the same token, we're like, most people don't mean it that way. Okay. I mean, I don't care. Like, how what your actions uh had a negative effect on me and i don't like it and as much as you can say you know oh that's just your interpretation you're not gonna logic me out of this i don't like it sorry you're not gonna make me like it and so if you are someone who emotes on stream to me uh yeah expect to be muted and expect for me to be like shut up man and i guess if that counts as name shaming and call outing I don't really think I have to apologize for that because you would never know if you didn't come to my stream. Which brings us to the actual thing about it, which is I feel like when I lose, there are a lot of people who will show up so that I, like after they win, so that people can be like, wow, good game, you played really well against against me. And that always makes me feel bad. It makes me feel like not only that I lost, but like, I realize this is the, a bad way to feel about it, but I'm going to be honest. It makes me feel like they took a little bit of who I am, and they're using that to further themselves. And that is why I react so poorly to it. And that actually is my issue. It's something that I try to work on, right? That's why I'm being honest about it, right? Like, I, that's how I feel. It's something that I'm working on. I'm trying to get better at it, and hopefully I will. But that is how I feel. It feels like people are trying to make a name for themselves at my expense. And that is something that bothers me. And so I think 
I'm never gonna be like, I remember you from emoting me. I'm never gonna do that. But if you only show up in my chat when you beat me, I am gonna remember that. I'm not gonna name and shame you, but it is something I'm gonna remember, right? Like, if I only have negative interactions with you, I am gonna remember that. And I realize that puts people who just want to be friends in an awkward situation. And it is why I'm trying to work on it. But I don't know. Maybe I'm being a little too vulnerable and a little too honest here. It does sort of make me feel like I am being consumed to fuel another. And that's a bad way to feel. And I, I'm working on trying to not feel like that. But... Frankly, that sounds more like the uh, purview of a therapist than my YouTube viewers. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for making it through that video. I don't know if you'll be able to tell, but this one was recorded live. Uh, I cut out a lot of the interactions with my chat, but yeah, I wanted to see what happened if I recorded live. Let me know if you noticed any differences here, and uh, thank you so much for watching the whole way through. I'm very grateful to those of you who support me. As always, I have been KM Best. You have been phenomenal, and I will see you in the next one.